1933 was a year marked by global turmoil and societal upheaval. The silver screen served as a canvas for the imagination to soar into realms of the fantastical and the futuristic. As the world grappled with the continuing Great Depression and the rise of authoritarian regimes, cinema once again offered audiences an escape. From tales of an invisible man and mysterious criminal masterminds lurking in the shadows, to epic adventures set amidst cataclysmic natural disasters and daring underground expeditions. The science fiction films of 1933 transported viewers to worlds both fantastical and thought-provoking, but also challenged viewers to contemplate the possibilities of the future in an ever-changing world. It's time for the return of the least well-known and probably most bizarre sci-fi subgenre, the science fiction musical comedy. It's Great to Be Alive takes place in 1954 and is directed by Alfred L. Worker. It's the story of a young pilot who, after being dumped by his girlfriend, leaves the world behind to fly solo out into the Pacific, only to crash land on a deserted island. Meanwhile, there is a pandemic called masculitis that kills all fertile men, making our main character, Carlos, the last fertile man on Earth. Women now control everything from government to the Chicago Mafia, and once rescued, Carlos becomes the object of every woman's affection. Before Carlos can be auctioned off to the highest bidder, he is apprehended by the government and declared federal property. Unfortunately, I had to rely on books and online sources for information about this remake of the 1924 film, The Last Man on Earth. I could not find a copy for a review, which is a shame because the plot sounds absolutely bonkers and could only work in a comedic setting. Starring along Raoul Rulien is Gloria Stort, best known for her Oscar-nominated role as the Elder Rose in Titanic. This is the first of two films featuring Stort that I'll discuss in this episode. If I could find just one clip from this film, I would love to see the one scene where two actors wearing really bad wigs and doing awful accents play Albert Einstein and Auguste Picard, who struggle to find a cure before it's too late, but to no avail. According to the American Film Institute website, there were potential production code violations even though the code wasn't strictly enforced until 1934. Quote, because of an overemphasis on sex as brought out through a situation where in a world of sex-starved females suddenly find one lone male whose presence brings about a series of humorous, but nevertheless rather badly suggested events, unquote. Producer John Stone would take steps to remedy the situation, saying, quote, have since given the scenario a most careful overhauling and eliminated the indicated and other objectionable points. Unquote. Reviews of the film were not entirely positive, and the music was not memorable enough to make the insane story seem realistic. There are copies of the film that do exist, as it was screened at the Museum of Modern Art in 2017, but it is not streaming or available on DVD that I could locate. If you find a copy, please let me know. Before continuing with the films of 1933, if you are enjoying the content, please give the video a thumbs up and subscribe for more History of Sci-Fi content. Your support is what keeps this channel thriving, and I'm thankful for everyone stopping by and sharing the love for this amazing genre. And I shall establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of the flood. Neither shall there be any more a flood to destroy the earth. This quote from the book of Genesis, chapter 9, verse 11, begins our next film. One of my favorite sci-fi subgenres is the apocalyptic disaster film. The American film, Deluge, from RKO Radio Pictures, is one of the lesser-known disaster films and is directed by Felix E. Feist. 
adapted from the best-selling novel by S. Fowler Wright. Starring Peggy Shannon, Sidney Blackmer, and Lois Wilson, it was made for a budget of 171000 After a massive earthquake hits the west coast of the United States, floods spread across the country and threaten New York City. Reports in Chicago and the northwest indicate that the Arctic Ocean is rushing from Hudson Bay and overflowing the Great Lakes. Chicago is doomed. Other broken messages indicate entire Mississippi Basin sinking. And scientists race to warn the populace of impending global devastation. But it's too late. Amidst the chaos, Martin Webster becomes separated from his family, but finds solace on a makeshift island with a beautiful stranger, Claire. While his wife, Helen, remains steadfast in her belief of her husband's survival. However, tensions arise after Martin and his wife are reunited. Martin has clear affections for both his wife and Claire, creating heartbreak and division within the newly formed survivor community. Touching on themes of resilience after collapse, the good and evil natures within us all, and how quickly a modern civilization can be destroyed, but also how quickly we resort to gangs and violence as well as rivalry over the few remaining women. Filled with religious undertones, our main characters find the good in the worst situations. This feels like a precursor to things to come in 1936 and the emerging ideas of apocalyptic aftermaths on Earth. But on the opposite side of the religious undertones is the implied nudity and sexuality as well as the main character's unspoken desire to keep both women as wives. Ideas that would not pass once the production codes went to full effect in 1934. The visual effects by Ned Mann, Russell E. Lawson, and Billy Williams provided the most notable element of this film. The four-minute destruction sequence of New York City and the Statue of Liberty, which would become popular ways to destroy cities in many disaster films over the years. Using impressive miniatures, the film was the first to show the destruction of a major metropolitan city. The effects footage would be sold to future productions, such as S.O.S. Tidal Wave in 1939. The novel's author, S. Fowler Wright, was disappointed in the final film and noted that he thought the film was, quote, ghastly. The first portion of the film with the detailed destruction of New York City was the best part. Though its visual effects may seem cartoonish by today's standards, it would have been quite impressive in 1933. The survival and rebuilding storyline was intriguing enough, and it was Claire who held my attention. A woman who can take care of herself no matter what, even if she does choose to swim everywhere, even to escape a tsunami. Though not the best example of the disaster film, I do recommend it for anyone who loves this subgenre to get an idea of how some of the now cliche tropes got their start. Deluge was a lost film until 1981 when an Italian language print was discovered and an English language print was found in 2016. It is available on DVD and Blu-ray and can be viewed for free on the Internet Archive. I'll link the black and white as well as the colorized versions in the description below. Before dubbing films into multiple languages became popular, a few European productions in the early 1930s would make multiple versions of a script with separate cast in their native languages. I discussed this in my previous episode regarding FP1 Antwortet Dict, which was filmed in three languages with separate cast. In 1933, the Bernhard Kellerman novel Der Tunnel was adapted into French and German versions by the director Curtis Bernhardt. Both tell the story of an ambitious group of engineers who construct a tunnel beneath the Atlantic Ocean to connect Europe with the United States. Of course, there is drama, sabotage, murder, and seemingly unsurmountable obstacles until the main characters reach their goal. 
Set against the backdrop of economic hardship and political unrest in the 1930s, both films explore themes of perseverance, camaraderie, and the pursuit of their dreams. Each film reflects the cultural and political context of its respective country at the time of production. But just like It's Great to Be Alive, I was unable to find a copy of either version of this film for review. I covered the 1915 adaptation of Kellerman's novel in episode 2 of this series, so I was at least familiar with the plot. The idea of a tunnel under the Atlantic would have been far more awe-inspiring in 1915. By 1933, pilots, including Amelia Earhart in 1932, were already flying solo across the Atlantic Ocean, so why bother with a tunnel? Information I was able to find regarding the production of the film focuses on Jewish director Curtis Bernhardt, who fled Germany and filmed the French version, according to Frenchfilms.org, before being, quote, compelled to direct a version in Germany, unquote. Exactly what compelled to direct meant is up for debate, but considering Bernhardt returned to Germany to film some outside location scenes and was arrested by the Gestapo, provides a few clues. He was able to escape and make his way to the United States. The German version starred Paul Hartmann, Attila Horbinger, and Olli von Flint, and the story was set between 1940 and 1955. We saw Hartmann in 1932's FP1 Antwerted Nicht. The French version starred Jean Gabon, Madeleine Renault, and Robert Levigan. A British-produced English-language version reusing some footage from these 1933 films would be released in 1935, and I'll cover that film in my episode covering the sci-fi films of that year. Most reviews I could find say the story was slow and meandering. The German version is said to have anti-Semitic characters and pure Nazi propaganda. Without viewing the film myself, I cannot comment on how much propaganda is in either version. And it is important to look at films within the times they were made, and not from a contemporary point of view. I wish I could comment more on the differences between the German and French films, at a time when Hitler was rising to power. Though it is said that Hitler himself liked the film, especially the work ethic of the German workers. There is a clip of the German version on Vimeo and a collection of still frames from the French version on YouTube. I'll link both in the description below. Multi-episode serials were popular in the 1920s during the silent era. They were cheaper to make and could be filmed with a small crew, with bit part and up-and-coming actors. In the 1930s, they were regaining popularity with stars like Bela Lugosi, Boris Karloff, and John Wayne. In the 12-episode serial The Whispering Shadow from 1933, a mysterious criminal mastermind orchestrates a series of crimes using a gang controlled by radio rays that both communicate to his henchmen as well as kill anyone who gets in his way. Directed by Colbert Clark and Albert Herman, the serial stars Bella Lugosi, Viva Tattersall, Malcolm McGregor, and Robert Warwick. But don't be fooled, Lugosi is only a supporting character even though he was top billed. This was his largest paycheck ever as an actor, receiving $10,000, a large sum for an actor at the time. The Whispering Shadow would be the first of five serials he would film in his career. With a production schedule between 12 and 18 days, I found some sources that said 12 while the others said 18, the story follows Jack Foster, whose brother was murdered by the Whispering Shadow. As he becomes embroiled in the investigation and suspects that the eerie Professor Strang, played by Bella Lugosi, may be linked to the crimes. Detective Robert Raymond is on the case. It turns out that almost everyone is out to find the Tsar's lost jewels. Employing constant false clues and decoy actions to keep nearly everyone a suspect, leading to a suspenseful climax where the truth behind the Whispering Shadow's identity is finally revealed. Is it the professor, his daughter, the countess, the convict, 
or one of the henchmen. The story structure works better as a serial than one feature film. Taking advantage of cliffhangers to keep the audience coming back gives us an idea of how popular television would become in the future. Much of the footage was reused throughout the episodes to cut down on cost and to remind the audience of previous plot points. But there is very little science fiction once you get past the radio death ray MacGuffin. It's more of a confusing, over-convoluted crime drama, with lots of fist fighting and car chases. There is some interesting cinematography with the use of the shadow when he appears. Lugosi has very little to do, which is a shame. I'd love to see more of his character, as well as the shadow himself, reigning over his criminal underworld. All 12 episodes are available on YouTube, and I'll link the playlist to the Old Serials Collection channel in the description below. I meddled in things that man must leave alone. These words from Dr. Jack Griffin not only summarize The Invisible Man, but so many other science fiction films of the 20th century. By 1933, Universal was in the horror movie business and wanted to continue their winning streak with the adaptation of another H.G. Wells novel, The Invisible Man. They purchased the rights for $10,000 and initially wanted Boris Karloff to star. In 1931, the Los Angeles Record even reported The Invisible Man as Karloff's next project. But salary negotiations fell through and Karloff was hesitant to work on a film where he didn't get to show his face until the end of the film. The Invisible Man is a science fiction horror film directed by James Whale. Initially, Whale, renowned for his 1931 film Frankenstein, hesitated to work on this project due to concerns about being pigeonholed as a horror filmmaker. Despite ultimately directing this film and then The Bride of Frankenstein in 1935, the script was a combination of his novel as well as The Murder Invisible by Philip Wiley. The film would go through several writers and directors before going with James Whale and screenwriter R.C. Sheriff. Original screenwriter Preston Sturges was dropped from the project because Universal thought his ideas were a little too out there while Sheriff wanted to stay closer to Wells' original material. And if you followed my previous episodes, you'll know that H.G. Wells had less than enthusiastic opinions about previous adaptations of his other works, especially The Island of Dr. Moreau. But he actually liked this film, though he did have some critiques about Claude Rains' choice of turning the character into a madman. Produced by Carl Lemley Jr. and starring Claude Rains as Dr. Jack Griffin in his first feature film, the former stage actor would go on to play memorable roles in Casablanca, The Adventures of Robin Hood, and Notorious. Co-starring with Reigns is Gloria Stort as Flora in her second sci-fi film of 1933, as well as William Harrigan as Dr. Arthur Kemp. The plot follows Dr. Jack Griffin, a scientist who discovers a way to become invisible, but never really struggles with the consequences of his newfound power. The story begins with a mysterious man whose head is completely covered with bandages as he arrives at a pub seeking a room and soon becomes a source of terror as his violent temper and secretive experiments reveal him to be the invisible homicidal maniac terrorizing the village. As Griffin's sanity deteriorates, he becomes increasingly obsessed with using his invisibility for personal gain and revenge. The film explores themes of power, identity, and the dark side of scientific advancement, culminating in a thrilling and suspenseful climax as Griffin's actions threaten to consume him. With a $328,000 budget, the film was praised for its visual effects and Claude Rains' performance. The Hollywood Reporter praised the film, declaring it, quote, a legitimate offspring of the family that produced Frankenstein and Dracula. Unquote, and predicted it would, quote, fare better than either of its predecessors. The New York Times placed the film at number nine on its 1933 10 best list. Visual effects artist John P. Fulton 
use double exposures to show Reigns taking off his clothes, and attach thin wires to objects to make them appear to move without help. In the September 1934 issue of The American Cinematographer, Fulton went into detail about the process. Using 4,000 feet of film and about 63,000 frames that needed individual retouching to get the right effect. This is a fantastic film that just flies. It jumps right into the story without spending any time on the backstory. We don't spend time with our lead before his transformation, like we see in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and we are given any necessary backstory through dialogue. The practical effects are the true stars of the film, elements that would be lazy CGI today. The cinematography works better in the original black and white than in the colorized version to set the proper tone and atmosphere. Several sequels, including a team-up with Abbott and Costello, would be made over the years, but none ever captured the allure of the original. The 2020 remake featuring Elizabeth Moss garnered acclaim from critics and had the potential for greater financial success. However, its theatrical release was cut short by the COVID-19 lockdowns in the United States. The Invisible Man is available on DVD and Blu-ray, as well as streaming for free on the Internet Archive. I'll place links in the description below for both the original black and white, as well as the colorized version. Interest in science fiction literature at this time was still centered around pulp magazines like Amazing Stories and Astounding Stories. Readers were captivated by tales of space exploration, alien encounters, and technological marvels. These serve as temporary escapes from the economic upheaval of the time. The science fiction literature of 1933 left a lasting impact on the public consciousness, with several novels captivating readers' imaginations. These literary contributions not only shaped the landscape of science fiction, but also served as catalyst for future filmmakers and storytellers, inspiring future sci-fi adventures and influencing the course of the genre. Though never adapted into a feature film, I do want to highlight a non-Western science fiction novel and the influence the genre had on readers around the world. Cat Country is a satirical science fiction novel written by Chinese author Lo Shi. The story is set in a dystopian future where a spaceship crashes on Mars, and the narrator finds the planet inhabited by human-like cats, who have evolved to become the dominant species. The novel explores political and social commentary through the lens of a feline-ruled society. Meanwhile, in the West, The Shape of Things to Come by H.G. Wells was published presenting a picture of the future that spans decades and tackles issues of technological and societal progress. After a war, the reimagined utopian society was ruled by a global government while replacing religion with a scientific and rationalized worldview. Wells offered a view of a potential post-war society. To guide humanity towards peace, he advocated for a single government that transcended nationalism and violence. Wells adapted his novel into the 1936 film, Things to Come, directed by William Cameron Menzies. It was also adapted into a Canadian low-budget film in 1979 and a radio drama in 2017. Also this year, Philip Wiley and Edwin Balmer wrote When Worlds Collide, the story of astronomers who discover two rogue planets on a collision course with Earth. As humanity races against time, to build spacecraft and escape, the novel explores themes of survival, sacrifice, and resilience of the human spirit in the face of cataclysmic events that would inspire numerous film and television portrayals of catastrophic events. This pre-World War II novel would be adapted into a film in post-war 1951. Released during the Cold War era, the film emphasized themes of survival and cooperation in the face of of global catastrophe. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear.
fear itself. Franklin Roosevelt's inaugural address, delivered in the middle of unpredictability and turmoil of 1933, carried a potent message encouraging Americans to face their anxieties head on. At this time, the world was at a crossroads, witnessing pivotal events that would shape the course of history for decades to come. From the rise of Adolf Hitler, to Winston Churchill's first warning about the risk of German rearmament, to the inauguration of Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the United States, the year marked a turning point in global politics, economics, and society. Japan and Germany left the League of Nations in March and October respectively, while the United States and the Soviet Union established diplomatic relations in November. A comprehensive understanding of the sci-fi films of 1933 compels us to take a brief exploration of the events shaping the global narrative. And so for the rest of the episode, I'll now pivot towards the broader societal influences on future filmmakers and storytellers. In 1933, Germany experienced escalating tensions with significant historical ramifications. It began with Adolf Hitler's appointment as Chancellor on January 30th, signaling the onset of the Nazi regime, which would profoundly impact both Germany and the world. The situation intensified with the Reichstag fire on February 27th, a pivotal event that allowed the Nazis to justify suspending civil liberties and solidifying their control. Furthermore, the opening of the first Nazi concentration camp at Dachau in March and the establishment of the Gestapo secret police in April further entrenched Nazi authority and repression within the country. But there was so much else going on in the world, and not all of it negative. We saw aviation milestones, including the first solo flight around the world, on July 22nd. Wiley Post, an American aviator, completed the first solo flight around the world, landing in Brooklyn after a seven-day trip in his plane named Winnie May. On December 5th, the United States saw the repeal of Prohibition. The 21st Amendment to the United States Constitution was ratified, officially ending the era of Prohibition that banned the sale and production of alcoholic beverages. In the cultural events of the year, we saw the premiere of The Lone Ranger on radio. On January 30th, The Lone Ranger, a popular American Western drama series, marked the beginning of a cultural icon that would extend through various forms of media. I want to tell you what has been done in the last few days and why it was done and what the next steps are going to be. On March 12th, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt initiated the Fireside Chats a series of radio broadcasts aimed at directly communicating with the American public during the Great Depression. These informal and reassuring talks conveyed information about his policies, addressed concerns, and fostered a sense of connection and confidence in his leadership during difficult times. In April, the Bauhaus, an influential school of modernist design, was closed by the Nazi regime leading to its dispersal of its faculty and students around the world. With the rise of the Nazi party in Germany, modern art and avant-garde styles would be suppressed, labeled as degenerate and purged from German consciousness. Several technological advancements were made in radio and television, which would have significant influence on the history of mass media. In June, a major milestone in the history of television occurred when a research group at RCA, led by Vladimir K. Zvorkin, publicly unveiled the iconoscope. This groundbreaking event marked the introduction of the first practical cathode ray tube television camera, contributing to the rapid advancement of television technology. And American inventor and engineer Edwin Armstrong patented frequency modulation FM radio, offering superior audio quality and eventually revolutionizing radio broadcasting. This year, we witnessed the debut of several unforgettable films, underscoring Hollywood's resilience and unwavering commitment to delivering captivating storytelling to audiences worldwide. Hollywood continued its dominance as the center of the film industry but also found new ways for audiences to view their films. 
The first drive-in movie theater opened in Pensacon Township near Camden, New Jersey. Drive-ins would be a popular destination, especially for younger audiences, for the next few decades. While our primary focus remains on science fiction films released in 1933, it's important to place them within the larger cinematic context. So I briefly want to delve into notable non-sci-fi films and significant industry developments that occurred during this era. This is by no means an exhaustive discussion of the year, but just a snapshot of events. Daryl F. Zanuck left Warner Brothers to form 20th Century Pictures with Joseph M. Schenck. The studio quickly gained prominence in the industry and eventually merged with Fox Film Corporation, and then later 20th Century Fox, solidifying its position as a major player in the world of cinema. Metropolis and Woman in the Moon director, Fritz Lang fled Germany after his last German-language film, The Testament of Dr. Mabuse, was censored by the Nazi party. He would eventually move to the United States and work in Hollywood until 1960. 1933 was the year iconic pair Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers appeared on screen for the first time in Flying Down to Rio. The Oscars for Films of this year awarded Best Picture to Cavalcade, the historical drama that follows the lives of two British families from the late 19th through the early 20th century, capturing their experiences from events such as the Boer War to the sinking of the Titanic and World War I, while Catherine Hepburn won her first of four Best Actress Oscars, this time for Morning Glory, and Charles Lawton became the first of many Brits to win for Best Actor. This year also marked the big screen debuts of future legends, Fred Astaire in Dancing Lady, Lucia Ball in The Bowery, and Errol Flynn in The Wake of the Bounty. The most significant film release of the year was King Kong, directed by Marion C. Cooper and Ernest B. Schoedzak. Starring Fay Ray, this epic adventure follows the capture of a giant ape on a mysterious island and its rampage through New York City, culminating in a tragic climax atop the Empire State Building. Not only did King Kong achieve critical and commercial success, making $5.3 million on a $672,000 budget during its initial release, as well as theatrical re-releases, it also revolutionized special effects in filmmaking with Willis H. O'Brien's groundbreaking techniques. O'Brien was best known for his work in The Lost World in 1925 and would later go on to work on Mighty Joe Young in 1949. He brought the titular character to life in a way that captivated audiences and inspired countless imitations. Beyond its technical achievements, King Kong popularized the monster movie genre, leaving an unforgettable mark on cinematic storytelling. Some other films of the year include... 42nd Street. This musical film directed by Lloyd Bacon and starring Warner Baxter, B.B. Daniels, with Ginger Rogers, and dance numbers choreographed by Busby Berkeley. It follows the trials and triumphs of performers in a Broadway musical, highlighting their struggles and successes both on and off the stage. Roman Scandals is a musical comedy starring Eddie Cantor and follows a hapless young man who is transported to ancient Rome where he becomes embroiled in a series of comedic misadventures. I'm No Angel, the romantic comedy film directed by Wesley Ruggles and starring Mae West, known for her provocative wit and charm as she navigates love, scandal, and success in the world of vaudeville. And finally, Little Women. This drama adaptation of Louisa May Alcott's classic novel was directed by George Cukor, and starred Katherine Hepburn, depicting the trials and triumphs of the March sisters as they navigate love, loss, and sisterhood during the American Civil War. Though the history of cinema in 1933 is best remembered for King Kong, the visual effects and achievements of The Invisible Man also stand the test of time, play an important part of how in-camera techniques were used to create groundbreaking cinema. The rest of the science fiction films of this year are not a part of today's public consciousness, but they played small roles in moving the genre forward, both visually 
and creatively. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe for more History of Sci-Fi film content. And I'll see you in 1934.